Um, I would like to st start by telling you I have a stutter, so if it's not always totally clear, um, I apologize, but hopefully you'll be cool with that. So uh, I wanted to start, since I'm in Paris, to add a little Parisian flavor to my talk. So here's a tweet that I tweeted a few days ago. Um, comparing JavaScript to uh, Java, if JavaScript is like the Eiffel Tower, Java is like the Mount Panas Tower. Um, those of you who live in Paris will get that. Um, the rest of you won't. <laughs> but here, here's an explanation. Mont Parnasse Tower, um, in case you didn't know, the Eiffel Tower is, is the other one. It's the one on the right. Uh, Mont Parnasse is very practical. It's very useful. But you wouldn't want to actually work there. It's the most mind-numbingly mind boring structure. Eiffel Tower is complete nonsense. Nobody knows what, it's, what it does. But it's, <laughs> but it's very cool. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a staggering work of genius. Um, so my talk is about l literature and programming. What can literature teach us about programming? Um, you're probably thinking, probably not that much. They're very opposite from one another. But um, let's, let's look at it this way. They're on opposite sides of the scale. Um, great literature is about open minds, about keeping, uh, keeping an open mind and being observant to everything that's going on. As programmers, we're often very, very narrowly focused on getting from A to B, getting the one task done that we really need to get done. And we're encouraged to only follow one style. Um, these are actual excerpts from well-respected style guides. Um, and as you can see, this is sane stuff. This is normal, sane, sane JavaScript, at least for the most part that we're being told we shouldn't, you know, not, not, to, not to try that stuff, not to go there. Um, it has a very constraining effect on the language and how we, we, we can use it. Here's another thing. This was kind of borrowed from another presentation I, I did. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. At one time or another, everything has been considered harm, harmful. <laughs> so if you... Listen to everyone, you can't use anything. <laughs> and this is a problem. This is actually a real problem for the language. We're kind of, we're kind of scared um, to do much of anything because, I mean, you only have to go on Stack Overflow or something like that, and you'll see that um, no matter what you ask, someone will point out some syntactical thing which has nothing to do with the question whatsoever. But people love to get in on that kind of stuff. So we're left with only one way to get from A to B. And so you can think of it like um, town A to town B. That's the only path you can take. We, we've basically, with our style guides and our, and our other things, um, we, we've cut off all the other options. So what happens when a tree falls on the street? And it's like um, a, 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 a comparison with coding is if um, for performance reasons, you suddenly can't use the thing you, you, you wanted to. Um, it's a pretty bad state of affairs. Now, literature is about embracing the entire language. Literature would never say, do this or don't do that. Literature is always exploring and experimenting and trying to use bits of the languages. And as programmers, if we embrace language, we get choices. And so instead of being blocked by a tree, there's other ways to go. So it gives us other, other options. Um, this is a quote from Peter Van Tuzé. Um, there are indeed many ways to do the same thing in JavaScript. That's one of the beauties of the language. And we should, we should bear that in mind. We should, um, we should always consider that. What sets JavaScript apart from many languages is options, alternatives. It can be anything you want. It can be imperative. It can be functional. It can be ob object-oriented. And rather than pigeonhole ourselves, categorize ourselves into one of those things and fly the flag for that one thing, we should always be trying to use whatever's best for the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and so with that in mind, all of the options are open. You have many ways to get from one place to the other. At least until the JavaScript please cut there. Um, right there. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. But perhaps most importantly of all, open minds keep, keep JavaScript fun. And a number of speakers have already spoken about that, how you've got to enjoy the work that you're doing. And if you were coding uh, Java or something, where you always do it the same way, um, yeah, you get it right, but it's, it's not much fun. And so um, a lot of people from other languages like Java, uh, Java, C++, would like to apply those same constraints. And we don't really have to. Uh, JavaScript has many more options than that. So um, there you can see <laughs> the Lion Cub on its, on its own is, is doing what it thinks is the right thing. But it's not enjoying itself. It's not exploring. It's not having fun. Not like the other two. Um, so again, as programmers, we're really not encouraged to experiment. And, and that's. That's the main theme of what I'm trying to say here. Um, JavaScript is kept alive by experiments. Um, this is actually a quote from this morning's talk, uh, Substack's talk. I <laughs> quickly shoehorned that into the talk. Um, but it's really good, because I, I, I loved it, because it said exactly what, what I was trying to say. You need to make mistakes in order to figure out what's actually good. And these are just a few patterns that were, were not liked at one time, and we're not encouraged to use them. They now just become standard because people took the time out to do it and took a chance, wrote code that maybe at the time they weren't encouraged to write, but has now become, um, become accepted. And um, some of the earlier frameworks did stuff like ex ex extending, extending, extending native prototypes, which was also seen as a really bad thing at the time. But the language without that would not have the features that it has. So um, I decided to take the experiment to the next level. So I wrote a book. I wrote a book called If Hemingway Wrote, wrote JavaScript. Now you're probably saying, what? <laughs> like, you know, authors and JavaScript is very different things. Um, so what this book is, is 25 famous authors, um, Ernest Hemingway, William Shakespeare, a lot, lot of other people. Uh, and I set five JavaScript problems and imagined what it would be like if they solved those. And by the way, just as an aside, you may know um, Hemingway developed this theory um, called the iceberg theory, which is basically for writing, uh, reporting, and, 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 and novels and literature that the facts are all you see. He just mentions the facts. The emotion and all the, the stuff that is not spoken is, is behind the scenes. And the reader of the article or the reader of the book has to figure that out for themselves. And that's way more powerful, because putting into words emotions is very hard. But drawing on the reader's own experience really, really brings those things out. So um, I thought, well, what if Hemingway's iceberg theory was applied to JavaScript? And again, this is, a, uh, this is an old slide that I did, but I think it works here. So this is what JavaScript is, basically, with the iceberg. <laughs> so you, you come to JavaScript, and you've got this familiar syntax. You say, oh, the, the, somebody comes along, and they say, oh, other. <laughs> but it's easier. <laughs> it's easier because, um, thank you. Thank you. It's easier because every, there's no types. You just declare a, var, a, a variable as a var. So what could be easier? And then this guy comes along, and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, so back to the book. So one of the problems I said set was to generate prime numbers. And the um, respected Argentinian author Jorge Luis Borges was one of the people I had. Um, solving this problem. And uh, hopefully, you can all see that. But he, he's very interested in like um, in uh, surreal stuff and out of this world stuff. So he imagined if a series of monsters was climbing a staircase, and the, each monster's stride was one greater than the previous one, then the untrodden stairs would be the prime numbers, because they don't divide by anything. So 
to give a visual perspective of that, this is what we have. So we have a monster with a stride of two, uh, steps on the even numbers said, a mon monster with a stride of three, steps on the odd numbers. And because we're only going to 14, that's all we actually need here. And the untrodden numbers, the white numbers, are the prime numbers. Um, next is uh, Lewis Carroll, uh, famous for the Alice books. And um, his solution is very unconventional, as a lot of his writing was very unconventional. Um, there's a lot of nonsense at the top, um, but I'm going to focus on the eval statement here. <laughs> so um, this eval looks pretty hard to figure out, right? But if we look, there's a join statement, another join statement inside that. So we're, basic, we're basically nesting two join statements. So let's look at the very simple case. If you nest two joins, this is, this is what you get. So say we nest, we have an array of five. We have an empty array with five, five, five elements in it. Um, capital A is on the outside and lowercase a is on the inside. Then we got a string, uppercase A, and then five lowercase, then another uppercase A, and five lowercase, etc. So we can do the same thing here. We can do it to this code and see what we get. And uh, oh dear, yeah, I know. But this is actually the generated code that comes from that eval statement. We can format it, and it makes a bit more sense. Um, what we basically have is the hatter is one factor, and the march hare is the other factor. And if you multiply those together, the result is not a prime number. Let me show you how this works. So we have a set of playing cards, and the mad hatter is one factor, and he's set to two. And then the March Hare is the other factor, and he multiplies by two, three, four, et cetera. And every time he reaches a card, he turns the card over, so like so. And then the, uh, the factor, the, the, the Hatter advances to three, and again, the March Hare multiplies three, turning over the cards as it finds them. So at the end, the remaining cards left are the prime numbers, one, two, three, five, seven, 11, and 13. And that's how that works. So, what have we learned? But we learned that playing is learning. Um, experiment, you learn from exper experiment. Um, I would say good programmers, I would guess, total guess, like 80% of what they do is not production code, is doing their own code in their own time. And yet it's amazing how many of us are afraid to break the rules, rules that we're given even when no one else is ever gonna see the code. Uh, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. And it's wrong because we don't learn, um, we don't find what alternative ways there are doing things, and maybe we'd find some idiom that goes into uh, JavaScript and becomes standard JavaScript behavior. Um, so this is kind of saying the same thing. I think I have a lot of respect for self-taught programmers because nobody told them the best practices are this, this, this. They just had to try it out for themselves, and they form their own best practices from making mistakes and realizing what works and what, oh, and what doesn't work. And they also built up a lot more alternatives. So when the tree falls in the street, there's other ways um, to do things. So in conclusion, uh, keep an open mind, experiment, play, have fun. Um, and that's it. Thank you.